Well, the other day when you were talking about this, uh, well, I was asking you about that, uh, you know, like sort of getting to the place for for meditation is more sort of like, you know, sort of, well, I think I think you said like, give give into the current moment. When I was on Bindabad, I was thinking about that. I said, oh, you know, it's been so long actually meditating on Bindabad. I've been so busy here, so I started really just trying to be aware of either the feet or the breath or even when I was walking. And like, they kind of thought, like, wow, it's like, you know, the, the, the environment is actually peaceful, so sort of, when the mind stops. <laughs> <laughs> but then I started thinking, like, what, what, what is it that's peaceful? It's, you know, it's almost a bit. Well, like, like, uh, like pure consciousness is peaceful, and when you stop agitating it with desires and thinking and all that, then you just feel at peace. <laughs> and that's where you know desire is always like the, the wanting something, wanting to get something you don't have, or not wanting what you have, or, or sense desires, you know. This, Using sensual desire to, for you know, wanting things to sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, and then, then the Bhagavad is all about wanting to get stick by eating. I, I want to become an arahant, you know. So then you 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 have a desire to become something that you think you're not. So that's Bhagavad and then you've got maybe kilases or defilements, you know, you get angry or restless or sleepy. And you want to get rid of that. That's what Pumada. So you see, we, you know, we tend to always stir up our mind. So this, this uh, letting go is, is more like this is a you know, where you can actually develop the practice of just letting go of things. And then the result is you really understand the result of that. It's peaceful. Your true nature is peaceful. Uh, even though you might see yourself as not peaceful, but you can't, then you see, you can't believe that because your mind will tell you anything. <laughs> so no, it'd be trusted. <laughs> I listen, I listen to, I spent years just listening to what my mind says and you know, I, I made a practice of just listening to it because it, it just goes on and, and in it, its habits, you know, it's conditioned to think in a certain way and react to it. Then you, but that which is aware of that, you see, that's that's uh, pure consciousness, and that that you is not a self, it's not it's not a condition. So you begin to see the point of resting in this awareness, being uh, abiding in this empty conscious state, in which then the your own karmic tendencies, habits, and that can be reflected on, but you're not struggling with them and making trying to get rid of the bad and hold on to the good and get something and get rid of things you, you stop doing that and then you begin that more wisdom wisdom then can, can manifest and you know can direct you so when Pachara used to call it like Obram Jit Dwe Panya to inform your mind the consciousness with wisdom and that's just, you know, in the simplicity of Buddhist teaching, that's seeing all conditions are impermanent. <laughs> and that's, that's, you can, uh, you know, you can prove that, you know, and just, and then uh, seeing that Dhamma, ultimate reality, is not personal and not a self, and not to pay tomorrow So, then there's wisdom. And it's uh, universal wisdom, it's not personal, it's not Buddha's wisdom, it's, it's, this is 
this is we're living in this realm as separate in separate forms, but we're united in consciousness. And so then we, we feel a sense of oneness with things when we let go of our identity with the body or the thoughts or the emotions, feeling. Then you know, you know, you know, you don't have these hatred and prejudices and all that kind of thing. Don't no longer hold in this. You know, they, they just like, you know, annoying insects when they're present, they go away. <laughs> but you know, you have. What do you see yourself? You know, how do you regard yourself as a person? And and then uh, we all have. A, you know, a sense of our, that I'm a separate person from you, and, and that, uh, and this is the reality that I can believe in. You know, that because that's how the world sees us. You're over there. I'm here. I'm senior. You're junior. <laughs> I'm old. You're young, and so on. It's a scene, because that's a body, isn't it? A physical body. And then your way of thinking, your memories are different. And maybe your emotional habits, you know. Maybe you, you know, you have strong feelings about something that I may not share. But on the conscious level, we're, we're united. So then, as we begin to recognize that, then we you know, we're more, we, we, can, we can accept the differences without creating any problems around them. You know, because we're conditioned in a certain way according to our culture, social position, nationality, race, gender, you're all kind of connected to these things as your identity. But with consciousness, that's what's unifying. So, when you say that, do you mean in kind that that my experience of consciousness, or the consciousness that I experience, is of the same nature as the consciousness you experience? It's the same consciousness. It's, it's the same entity. Is it? Yeah. See, try to contemplate consciousness being, you know, infinite. It's just not, you know, it's not inside you and inside me. Is, is this We're inside consciousness. At this moment, all of us are inside the same consciousness. The consciousness is the same. I think I've heard the analogy like two, two glasses in a, in, a, in a body of water. Yeah. And so, so this is, and then, then we each have, you know, we're separate in form, different names, different ages, nationality. Then, then these are differences, uh, you know, in, in the condition realm only. But the consciousness is the same. I mean, I'm not asking you to believe this, but just co contemplate, man, it, it's quite beautiful. Because then you feel connected to everything, you know, the nature and it's, the, you know, the whole universe is one conscious, it's unitive, it's, it holds, you know, it's embracing the whole. And then you even feel, you know, respect for nature, animal life and things like this that you don't, when you're always seen in terms of personal <coughs> biases or, you know, you know, like, like uh, I was brought up to think God made the animal kingdom for us to eat. <laughs> so, I mean, that's a different way of looking at life, isn't it? You know, that all this God created for me to, to eat. <laughs> Whereas with the Buddhist, you know, a, a mosquito, a buffalo, a dog, 
and us in the same consciousness, this relationship to all those things, you know, you kind of expect their right to be what they are in form, you know, they have different forms. And so they have, you know, like a mosquito has to have the mosquito karma because of its form. And a dog or a buffalo or a bird. <coughs> so it's, uh, and that's its karma, the shape, you know, the shape, the, the form that different species have. You know, and you wonder why birds that are, <coughs> you know, can migrate to places they've never you know, they may have been born up in Canada and they migrate to South Africa. How do they know the way? <laughs> it's the, because their form and the karma of that form, they know how to get from the Arctic Circle to South Africa. They can have very interesting experience, but it's not, it cannot explain it with science. There were two islands with monkeys, with the same kind of monkeys. And the scientists teach the monkeys on one island some some skills. And then they and uh, then they left the island and they were very separate, they could not cross over or something. And then they came back and uh, one year later and then the monkeys on the other island discovered the same trick. <laughs> and they called it then, you know, so uh, yeah. uh, unconscious, uh, unconscious, uh, what we share with. Like a bit of maybe subconscious telepathy or something. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but you know, they couldn't explain it. You, you, and also with often scientific uh, breakthrough, you know, for many years scientists have searched, nothing happened, and then at the same time three mm -hmm. getting into it. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's a. Something you know, this experience because we're connected, you know. yeah, because it's the same consciousness. So, you know, it's also working, you're also getting there. Well, this is like you know, you in the, in the basic poly teaching, you know, conscious space and consciousness are you've got earth, fire, water, air, space, consciousness. And uh, and so much in the like in the Vipassana movements and that you know in the states and even here in Thailand they emphasize uh, the impermanence of earth, fire, water, and air a lot. You know, so you're always staying, contemplating the Nietzsche because the four elements, everything is, can everything form can be reduced to these four elements. You know to the solid element, the liquid, the heat, and the air. And so, you know, the, the all animals, trees, everything can be, you know, seen in terms of elements. But all around us is space. And, and then we think, you know, my space? Do I, am I the owner of the space, or is this space? It, it, it makes it possible for all of us to be in this space at this moment. And yet, how many people really contemplate space? And yet it's with us all the time, you can actually notice it, visually, you know. And then consciousness, we're all conscious at this moment. And uh, and it's the the sixth element, you know, so it's it's uh, it, it has no boundary space. These are the boundless ones, immeasurables. Space consciousness. So that um, that always puts things into perspective. If you just have forms without space and consciousness, you would have no perspective on the forms. You have ideas and forms, likes and dislikes. Is about all you can do with it. But uh, with uh, conscious, with space and consciousness, conscious space is easy one because you can actually see it through the eyes, notice it, just by not taking an interest in the forms. It's like, ah, oh, this is space. <laughs> <laughs> and wherever you go, it's, you know, it's not. This is the only space. Is everywhere. And it's all, you know, we're, we're forms in this space. So that brings us 
and when you contemplate that, that means where the space is unity, you know, where all forms in space, and then consciousness is knowing, intelligence. And it's, it's not about IQ kind of, you know, like learning all, all the things, having a, a genius mentality, but it's about um, knowing and in in, through wisdom, reality. And that's, that's here and now too, so so vinyana, akasa, space vinyana is consciousness, and that ties you chitta all the time for consciousness. Because vinyana, they connect with ghosts. You know, you say vinyana, they ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> But jitta is it's the same thing. So, how does that relate to with the senses? You have the sense base and the sense object, and you have sense consciousness arising. So that's a kind of like a momentary yeah. thing that's arising. How does that relate to the kind of this universal consciousness? Well, it, you know, we experience through senses. So you're conscious through eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body. And then, uh, then we have, we're conscious, you know, thinking and, and that. So we, we're conscious through the senses, but, you know, but, but it's like a, you know, the senses are impermanent and, you know, blind man is still, he can't see. And if you plug his ears up and, and his nose and <laughs> so on, he's going to end up still with consciousness, you know, at the end of the day. It's that you can't plug up, it's just natural. But it's a, it's a, it's a consciousness that is universal rather than dependent on sensory organs to experience. In the Diga Nikaya they, they have uh, this, this um, one of these stories about this pilgrim wanting to find out where can earth, fire, and water without remainder and did you ever read that? <coughs> and he goes to these different levels of then they have to see the heaven and that and they say, Oh we don't know that, we have to go to the next goes up to Brahma, the, the top God, you know, and I have this burning question, where the earth, fire, water and air cease and, and uh, Brahma is kind of embarrassed because he doesn't know, so he says, oh, I'm the great Brahma, I'm, you know, powerful beyond any measure. I know everything. <laughs> I know everything. And the pilgrim says, well, you know, I know that already, but where do we look? <laughs> and then, and then uh, Brahma takes the guy aside and says, you have to ask that question to the Buddha. <laughs> No, but don't let them know that. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of humor in the Shabitika. <laughs> and so then uh, the pilgrim goes there and, and uh, the pilgrim asks, where did the fire and water cease without remainder? And then the Buddha says, that's the wrong question. He says, where do earth, fire, water, and air no footing find consciousness? Mm. And then he uses a kind of vinyanang, anidasanang, anandang, sapado, pamang, which is, you know, consciousness, infinite, bright, uh, splendid, and that kind of thing. So <coughs> that's where there's no footing, you know. If you're, if you're with that, then earth, fire, water, air can't find a, a foot in it. They appear and disappear, that's all.
So, so you don't have to go to Brahma. <laughs> <laughs> So that, that's where the unconditioned has a possibility. Well, this is the, the brilliance of the, the way the Buddha talked, because the unconditioned, you, you can't try to imagine unconditioned. And you, a conditioned thing, you can imagine any old thing, any fantasy, you know, or remember, you know, this is a, a cup and, and this is a table and things like that, but then you know, you can even fantasize, you know, I create the perfect cup and the perfect table in your mind, it forms, <laughs> and, uh, and different colors and shapes and sizes, and that's the condition. What's the unconditioned? You can't, it, it's just a negation that you use that pre prefix unconditioned, unborn, uncreated, unformed. And what is that? You know, is it? I mean, it baffles people. But I mean, when you kind of explore your your thinking mind, you know, you kind of try to explore. You know, can you cre can you create something uncreatable? <coughs> you can't even imagine it. <coughs> when you kind of understand it in a way as an abstraction in your brain. But what is it in reality? Because this teaching the Buddha said there is the unborn. It's a statement of fact. It's not supposition or just philosophical, you know, metaphysical ideals. It's saying there there is the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned. And then then you ask, well, what is that right now? If there is, and then they, then he says that. Because there is the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned, there's escape from the born, the created, the condition. So we're not just helpless, they stuck in our conditions, you know, like it seems. You know, sometimes you seem like you're just trapped in a body or with your thoughts and habits, and it's just like there's no way out of it. It's just, you know, you just got to live it out, kind of a bitter feeling that if there's the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned and if there was not this there'd be no escape to me that is wonderful and that's a statement of fact that's not metaphysical philosophy and uh, so then, uh, then I said what is it then what is the reality of unborn, uncreated right now because if it there is it has to be now it can't be because things in the future are always, you know, fantasies or ideas or wishes and that that we have. So it has to be now. And then just by questioning like that, you begin to realize that the, this mindfulness practice is, the, you know, it says the, this is the gate, the doorway to that. So it, it, in a way we can connect or recognize the unborn, uncreated is be mindful in the present. And this is the essence of the teaching, you know, of Buddha's, Buddha, the essence of the Dhamma. Awake now, non-grasping, and then, then you, then you practice that, you know, try to experiment with yourself, you know non-attachment non and so eventually if you keep doing that you, it'll all come together for you and then you'll understand those teachings in a way that isn't just you know, you're understanding the words and the theory but actually you've had the, the reality of it, the insight because it's pointing to reality it's not, it's not a philosophical theory in the same called the Buddha nature you know Maya. they call it different thing Buddha nature or you know about Nibbana what is that and uh, people are always trying to define Nibbana 
But he, he doesn't need definition, it's a reality. I and mean, then it's just to be realized, not to be uh, defined. Like a space, can you define space? Uh, you, you're in it, you know, you don't need a definition of it because you're experiencing it. Consciousness, do you need to go to the Pali dictionary to find out the meaning of vinyana? We're, we're experiencing it right now, you know, it's, you don't have to go and find out what somebody tells you. It's, a, it's the reality of now. And it's learning to, you know, sometimes you, you know, our personalities tend to trust the, what the Pali dictionary says. Because that's written by, you know, scholars and people, authoritative people that have a lot of learning. But, you know, if you begin to, to, to use more mindfulness practice and stop looking for someone else to tell you, then you, you find out, you realize it's yourself. Yes, that's all, because, you, know, you know, we we are highly conditioned, so it's, but those, those flashes, you know, are important. <laughs> After a while, they, they have more, it doesn't become just flashes, there's a connectedness. But in the beginning, it's usually flashes of insight, reality. You know, it just goes by very quickly, but it's, even with that, it's you're something in you's changed. You know, you're no longer the same, even though you don't know it. You may not. You know, you may think, "Oh, I'm lost it again. I'm hopeless," and go back into that kind of thing. But don't believe it. You know, it's it's like you suddenly get the real understanding. It isn't just uh, you know from inspired feelings, but through insight. It changes you, you know, it, it has its effect, even though afterward you may think you've lost it and you can't do it or whatever, but don't believe that kind of stuff that your mind says. Your mind will tell you all kinds of lies. So. <laughs> That's why people are so miserable, they believe their minds, you know. Like a lot of people in the Western world, like in, in Britain, or, you know, have these, uh, what they call inner tyrants, this incredibly abusive judgment thing in their mind, you know. You're hopeless, you screwed up again, you... <laughs> and that kind of thing. And, you should never have said that, and, and it goes on, you know, into, you know, it can really, some people have a really strong one. And, and Irish people, you know, because they're brought up in the Catholic Church, and it's, it used to be very fire and brimstone, you know, <clears throat> they, and on retreats, sometimes they suffered incredible guilt, you know, feeling totally worthless and sinful, and dirty and all that because making mistakes in life you know it's not that they've done anything that bad but the, the inner tyrant is is one of these uh, forces you know whatever they do is never good enough there's a hopeless sinner no matter what 
<clears throat> and if you can, because they're interested in pussing on meditation, and then, then you can get them to start changing their attitude towards it, not believing the tyrant. Because it's just conditioned to do that, even if you, you know, are perfectly moral and proper, keep all the rules, the laws, uh, that the inner tyrant would say, you're still a bloody sinner and you... <laughs> it just doesn't know how to say, well now you're okay. It won't say that. <laughs> Relax. Because <laughs> you're not perfect. You're not an Arahant or not this. So you have some point I can... <laughs> I remember the story that touched me about the, uh, the Australian neighbor who was saying that the Dalai Lama first came to the West. And he's asking, people were asking questions, and somebody asked him how they should deal with their depression. And the translator didn't have a word to translate depression, they, didn't, they don't have that word in Tibetan. And then he said, um, Well, maybe can they explain how they feel to me? And then she, she, she explained the self hate, the self criticism, and uh, he's like, oh, I've never. How many people feel like this? He said, like, that's 50% of people put their hands up. And he, the Dalai Lama started crying. And he said, I've never, oh, I've never come across that. Right. Because the Tibetans don't see that. They don't do that. that. Self criticism. <laughs> same with the time. The same thing time. happened in Amarbati one time. When Tanjar Kumpanyananda, he, he died a few years back, but he was one of these, you know, he was a contemporary to Buddha Dasa. And he was always very helpful to us. One time he came down to Ravati, and Ajahn Jayasara was there at the time, translating, you know, because his Thai is very good. And so, Chao Kun you know, the, the hall was full of English people, European men and women, and uh, asking questions. And, and so, they asked about asked a question about guilt and uh, Ajahn Jayasaro, uh you know translated that into Thai but you know Chakun Panyananda they don't really have the same concept that what these people meant you know and Jayasaro was trying to make it clear to Chakun and he he looked more baffled and then Ajahn Jayasaro tried other words and I'm talking about, and then uh, finally they described it, and he said, "Oh, well, that, that's just a minor problem. <laughs> Ties don't have much of that." Well, uh, <laughs> you know, we're guilt-ridden, so you know, all of us suffer from incredible guilt, obsessions with guilt about you know, carrying around this sense of, you know, 20 years ago I killed a chicken or something. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's pretty heavy, but how I many people, you know, feel guilty about the fact that they have anger or sexual desire or things like this, you know, they'll carry this around, you know, this worry, guilt, and feeling worthless. <coughs> Because uh, that's a big problem in in the Western world, but not in Asia, not so much. Well, I think the the Thai basically, you know, they they the Asian, as you find it in India, China, any any Asian, if it's not Christianized or or Jewish, then you find. Uh, that they have a different world view, like you're born, your true nature is pure and never tainted, but then you create these uh, negative conditions. So you, so basically you're not a sinner, you're not bad, your true nature is pure, and then you, but you create impurities through ignorance and selfishness. And that. That's the that's the paradigm for like Thailand or Dalai Lama but then you know in the Judeo-Christian world you're born in sin and uh, 
and you've got to try to be good to get God to forgive you and favor you you know so this is this is how I was brought up now whether anybody really believes it or not but it it's part of a, an attitude that that even if you're not a Christian but you're living in, in countries that uh, have cultures that come from that those traditions it, it, it generates a, a kind of attitude towards yourself which is you feel guilty because and also you know like we can create we're idealistic so we can you should love your mother and father and you you should be kind and and you should be honest and never tell lies and you shouldn't be greedy and, and then we you know we we have ideals about how things should be which are high high they're ideals you know so they're way up there like the stars but we have to live on the ground where things aren't ideal and so we judge we can judge ourselves according to the ideal and you're never going to win that's why the tyrant you know and it comes and says you know you no matter how good you are you're still not good enough because that, that's because we're we have the we attach to an ideal and then the reality of our life isn't ideal you know to deal with human body with its energies with its pleasure pain principles with sensory experience these aren't ideals these are you know sensitive changing forms that we don't have that much control over you know you've got to deal with life as it happens you know you can't you know control freak mentality wants to organize everything and and keep all the bad things away but even at the greatest efforts one might have is still we have to deal with ugly things bad odors cacophonous sounds cold too hot too cold hunger thirst sexual desires all this is just you know, it's just uh, it's the way this realm is. It's, it's a sense realm, not an ideal realm. And, and but we can feel guilty about sexual desire or hunger. I've seen Western monks feel guilty about eating food because mm. <laughs> they they think they shouldn't have any kind of like hunger is greed. But the body needs food. You know, and they, you have to nourish it. You know, it, it's not greed of the body, it's a, it's a survival mechanism. Well, the Buddha made it clear that it wasn't asceticism, you know. It's not about torturing yourself. So, one, you know, you can have three meals a day before noon if you want. You can eat biscuits and munch on chips and things like that but I mean it's not breaking them in now but then we're in the Tudunga tradition with the more strict but but Bhajan made it very clear you know that I did a lot of fasting in the beginning going without food and, and I was doing this quite often and then one day I decided I was wanting to fast again and I went up and asked them Bhajan if I had permission and and he said, well, why, why are you always doing that? You know, look at it. And he pointed to the monk sitting next to him. He says, he just comes, eats his meal, and goes. It's just one meal a day. And suddenly it, it clicked. You know, suddenly I realized what I was doing. You know, and the monk that was, he was pointing to, you know, had a, had a lot of food in his bowl. It wasn't... <laughs> <laughs> He wasn't, you know, on a kind of diet or strict attitude about it. He'd take, you know, and then no pacha, you know, I'd take just a little bit of sticky rice. And he said, no, take it, you know, <clears throat> and go like this. Oh, really? Yeah. Because yeah. I taught to sleep little, talk little, eat little. Yeah, that's the party line. <laughs> <laughs> Because one, a day, one meal a day is eat little, you know. But also, I mean, it's, you know, you, 
you can feel guilty about eating a lot on one meal but especially when you're young you need uh, you need food like one uh, in Chithurst in England years ago there was a young New Zealander who was full of energy you know he just uh, you know just uh, <laughs> explode every moment and and here this was a time when we were uh, you know had a lot of work we were Chithurst house was a derelict house you know and we had to rebuild it refurbish it and this took a lot of energy and so then he'd go bend a box in the kitchen you know to collect the food and, and people complained that he took so much food and he was greedy but he never gained any weight he's uh, you know he needed mm. he's burning it up like you know <laughs> I don't know that was a like a fr- yeah. yeah he was young and he had this energy and if I ate like that I'd, I'd really you know be enormous I think this is like a point as well like everyone seems to like oh look what Charles said this and then they said like, you know everybody has to do it but I don't know like, he must have obviously given tailored advice to people for different reasons obviously like, maybe well I mean you know he in those days in the dining hall you know he'd sit you know right and then they had these this is like narrow hall we built it I helped build it but and then Dean's you know benches on both sides and so you know we were all sitting in tavern according to seniority and the Pacha was you know he'd have all kinds of food there and people offer special food to him and and then he, when his mother was alive he'd always uh, he'd bring one of these tiffin carriers bintos you know and then he'd he would uh, f- fill the, the bintos up for his mother, who was a manchi, and, and uh, then they take that to her. So, and then, you know, he he always had a kind of a, all kinds of separate dishes around, and, and uh, yes, he loved kwetiau, you know, noodles and things like that. And then, then sometimes. Well, you know, but he'd also, you know, put all the curry things in in one big basin, you know, so it was tasted awful, you know, because you're mixing chicken and pork and fish, everything in one big, you know, these galamangs, these enamel basins, and stir it up. It's really revolting. But he, and he didn't have to eat that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you, then you know, your mind goes, well, he makes us do it. You know, you, you kind of accuse him in your mind of, you know, <laughs> making a, torturing us. But he had a point, you know, that he was, you know, actually, I never suspected he was doing it out of, because he enjoyed seeing us stuff. He's helping us to just eat. And, um, because the idea, you know, is not for fun, not for pleasure. But, I mean, that's the way of training. And after a while, you know, you know, you you can sustain that and, I, and learn from it. But you're not, you don't really want to do that your whole life. <laughs> but also, I mean, like, like, uh, we, you know, we were allowed to have separate dishes, like people come in and offer like uh, separate dishes of some kind of pudding or sometimes they, they know the Pocha like radio, so they make this really delicious noodles and uh, but I hear terrible stories about how fierce and <clears throat> you know, the Pocha was, I never saw him as fierce. <clears throat> I never was frightened of him, you know, like, uh, I could, I mean, he could be strict and stern, but I always trusted him. I liked being around him. He was a lot of fun, great humor. And he loved to, you know, like, we'd go to, uh, sometimes we'd be invited to Warian or some place in Uborn, you know, like there was this big movie theater in Uborn. And the owner invited us all there, and the Chinese 
woman and they presented us with a really delicious food and uh, and those events look what charges led us you know didn't mix anything we could just indulge ourselves oftentimes we overindulged and then then one time I saw all the monks filling their bowls with the extra food and and then I found out later it was uh, to take back to give to the people in Bangor, Ajahn Chah's relatives because they uh, seldom get such delicious food <laughs> and of course the Thais understand this you know but for a western mind you know it's got this kind of this is a way to do it it looked like you know they're taking this food and for somebody else is off. but actually the woman the owner of the theater she made it happy that when Pocha was taking her food back to feed uh, people in Bangor. 